Good morning, church. This morning's scripture reading will be from the book of Psalms. We're going to be reading from Psalms chapter 137, verses 1 through 6. Psalms 137, verses 1 through 6. And this morning I'll read from the NIV version. Psalms 137.1 By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There, on the poplars, we hung our harps, and there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May, th may my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth, if I do not remember you, if I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. Thank you. There's a debate in the academic world on this psalm as to whether it was written uh, after the Babylonian captivity, or written during the Babylonian captivity. Um, it doesn't really matter as far as our sermon is concerned this morning, but if you're studying it, you may uh, want to do some looking at that. I think that there is evidence even within the psalm that it was written while in captivity. Um, whether I'm right or wrong, again, doesn't really matter for our sermon this morning. For the last who knows how many months, maybe years, we've been discussing the aspect of the Jews in the Old Testament, of course, and that uh, we've talked about the kingdoms, the divided kingdoms, and, and how Assyria came in and took the northern kingdom away, and Nebuchadnezzar came and took Judah away into captivity. And you recall that leading up to their being carried away, that over and over God sent his prophets and said, change, don't, don't do this, you, you need to come back to me. And he warned and warned and warned that they would remain faithful or that they would come back to him and be faithful to him. But the time came where they weren't going to be faithful. And so God, through his prophet Jeremiah, said, okay, here's what's going to happen. Since you're, since you're not going to straighten up and you're not going to come back to me, you're going to go into captivity and you're going to go for 70 years. Of course, the false prophets came and said Jeremiah was a nut bar and, and that uh, uh, the fact of the matter is we're only going for a little while and we're going to come back. And over and over we've talked about that. But the fact of the matter was this. God said, straighten up. In fact, through the prophet Ezekiel, I love the way he says it in, the, in Ezekiel, and he also says it in Jeremiah, why will you die? You know, why, why are you choosing to do this? I, I don't want you to do this. I, I want you to come back to me. Why will you do it? And yet, they didn't listen. And so, they went into Babylonian captivity. And this psalm is a reflection of some of those who were carried away in the captivity. But understand that they were carried away in the captivity because God's children were not faithful. They worshipped other gods. They served, uh, they served uh, the sun, moon, the stars. They served animals. They served idols that they carved out of rock and out of stone. And so, they went into captivity because of it. Well... We understand that it's God's unfaithful that caused them to do that, but partially we also need to understand that what we're reading here, I believe, in Psalm 137, is some of the faithful who ended up paying the consequences for being around the unfaithful, right? Because sometimes that happens to us, doesn't it? We can be faithful, but those around us are unfaithful to God, and we still have to pay sometimes because of what they have done. And so we know that there were many faithful that were carried away into captivity. I think about Daniel, right? He was faithful. I think about um, Ezekiel. He was faithful. We think about the three Hebrew youths, right? Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah carried away, but they were faithful. And I think what we're seeing in Psalm 137 is we're seeing brethren, uh, I say, we're seeing God's children who were faithful and they were carried away. 
Now, what's interesting about these individuals is that they had a special job. These were, these were individuals who were singers. They were in the temple. You recall that if you were to read David's instruction about how temple worship should take place and the order of things, and of course, God laid out who the priests were going to be, but they had certain people who could sing and certain people who would play instruments and they, they had a certain order to do things. These individuals in Psalm 137 were those who were singers and players at temple worship in Jerusalem. And so we find them saying, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. Upon the willows or poplars, as Nick read this morning in the NIV, poplars in the midst of it, we hung our harps. For there our captors demanded of us songs, and our tormentors uh, mirth or joy and rejoicing, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. And so here they find themselves in captivity. Their whole, their whole life, their whole reason for existence, uh, and whole purpose in life was to be in the presence of God, at the temple to play the instruments, hear the harps, and to sing before the Lord. Now, for a Jew, that was the only place that they would that they would do that outside of the temple. As we had in a lesson long ago, you understand that they would never think about using instruments away from the the temple of God. And so now, their whole life, the reason that they live, had been snatched away from them. They'd been pulled away from the temple. They'd been taken away from their hometown, and they'd been moved across a desert and put into Babylon. And so here they are in despair and in captivity. And they're reflecting upon it, and they're, they're saying we're down by the rivers of Babylon, and here our, our captors are there. And what are we doing while they're there? We're weeping. We're sad because... We're being held captive, and, and we didn't even do anything that, that warranted it as far as we individuals are concerned. And so we wept when we thought back about our life and the fact that we could worship. And let me ask you, and this just popped in my head, uh, it's extra, uh, no charge. Did you feel like during our absence from each other for a year, before we could gather back together, was this maybe our attitude of, yeah, we sat down on the sofa to watch watch YouTube, but really inside we're, we're weeping because we couldn't be together. How much we longed for the way, the way God wants it to be, uh, us to be together and, and to worship, right? And so here, here these, these faithful find themselves on the banks of the river, and they are weeping because they're thinking about home and they're thinking about worship and they're thinking about praising God. And so what do they do? They hang up their harps in the trees and sit down and do not sing. But the captors, the Babylonians here, are saying, sing us a song, almost taunting them. Sing us a song. Tell us a song of, of Zion. Sing us a song of, of the Lord's song, verse 4. Uh, how is it, they say, though, that we can sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? How in the world could I do that to God? You see, for the Jew, God was, he was at the temple. He, he, he wouldn't be there in, in Babylon in the way that they were thinking. God's worship, God's praise and the playing and singing of, of music, it, it only took place in the temple. How can we do that to God? And so they make a commitment, right? And they say, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget her skill. What's the skill? Here, it's playing the harp, isn't it? And may my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. In other words, no more singing. Make it, It'll stop if I don't remember Jerusalem the way I should. If I don't remember you, if I don't exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. In other words, being in the presence of God was the most important thing for them. And if I forget, and if I fail 
to remember that God is the most important thing, then take away my, my ability. Take away my, my ability to sing. Take away my ability to play. Take it all away. Well, quite a commitment. And I think about them and I think about how, how could it be that this could be something we could bring to you and me today and relate to? I, I think we've already mentioned one thing there from verse 1. But I, I think about this, and I briefly mentioned it already, and that is that sometimes, as children of God, as Christians, right, we are, we are caught captive because of the unfaithful around us. And sometimes we don't know, usually we don't know, at least I don't anyway, how to respond and how to live with that. Right? We've discussed before about the justice of God, of course, and, and that we know that bad things happen to good people, right? And good things happen to bad people. And we went through the book of Ecclesiastes earlier in the year, and, and we, we decided uh, uh, from the inspired word, don't try to make sense of that. You, you can't do it. God says you can't. It's going to keep happening. But we've got to learn how to live for the Lord in those circumstances, right? How do we do that? Well, as I think about this, I think about the fact that um, there are a couple of things that we want to look at with this text. Number one, we want to make two comparisons here. And I jumped ahead of myself and didn't realize it, so I'm going to go back just a touch. One is this. We see that the unfaithful cause the faithful to pay. You Have you ever been in a situation where you were the one who was unfaithful and the consequences of your sin caused others to suffer? I can tell you, I, I've, I've been guilty. I, I would expect that most of us here at some time in life have been guilty of, of straying from what God wants us to do. And when we do so, those closest to us, right? A lot of times family especially, but those closest to us and friends, they end up paying consequences because of my actions. Here's the thing. While none of us here is perfect, now that we're living for the Lord, we want to do our best not to be that person, right? And recognize that none of us here really ever just sin to ourself. It's going to affect somebody somehow. Our actions are going to affect them. We don't want to be the cause. I don't want to be the cause of you falling away from the Lord. I think about words that, that uh, are told in other places in Scripture just a few pages over. The book of Proverbs chapter 6, these are, these are words you're familiar with. Six things that the Lord hates, yes, seven are an abomination to Him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil. A false witness who, utter, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife or division among his brothers. You've heard those words before, haven't you? And yet, if we were to think about these words, this is exactly what Israel had done. They did all these things that caused them to go to captivity. Let me ask you, you ever been caught up in a church split before? Does it bring great anxiety to you? The pain that was caused by maybe some who did the very things we just read about in Matthew chapter 6. You know what? No church split can ever not affect the whole body. Everyone's hurt from it. And it's, I've never been involved in a, or known about a church split or been involved. I, I, my first work at a preaching training school. Oh man, you should still pray me, for me for this one. Because <laughs> I got out of preaching training school, went to a congregation that had no elders. And I was the first one there after a split. That was rough. The, the thing is this, though. I've never seen one, really, over the book. It's usually over the color of the carpet or the paint, right? Or I didn't get my way. Am I right? 
Yeah. And then we want to politic sometimes, don't we? We got to get people on our side. And 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 we're we're falling into the Proverbs 6 when we're doing that. You know, look, here's the thing. You do not want to be that person when God returns. When the Lord comes to judge us, you do not be the, want to be the one that, that, that did this thing. I don't think that the Scriptures teach us at all to take lightly anything that the Lord hates. Don't be that person. I remember the words of the Lord. Matthew chapter 18. You remember how he spoke concerning those who would uh, cause others to stumble? He said, it's inevitable that stumbling blocks come. They're, they're going to happen. You can't get around it, right? This is the Lord telling you they're going to come. But woe to the man that causes that causes it. You'd be better off taking a millstone, which if you do much looking in, in archaeology or look at old Israel, you're looking at a big old stone, right? Humongous thing tied around your neck and thrown into the ocean. You're better off doing that than causing someone to stumble. Look, the Lord just doesn't play around with this stuff. It, it's serious. Let's not be the one who causes the division. But also, what about us? I think in a crowd, in our crowd here this morning, we may be more the ones who find ourselves the faithful who are suffering because of the consequences of the unfaithful. And we may find ourselves in a situation where we're captive of no fault of our own, right? Can you think of some instances where this might be the case? I can think of a couple. Let me ask you. Do you ever know somebody that they get older and they can't take care of themselves anymore? And they have to move in with somebody, don't they? And so the, 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 the faithful brother or sister lives their whole life serving the Lord and then they got to move in with a child right who ain't who ain't them who who's not faithful who isn't really going to be concerned if you get to be with your brethren each week who isn't really concerned that you aren't going to be in the presence of the almighty and taking of the lord's supper as, as steve just mentioned to us they're not going to be concerned about that and so now what's happened you found yourself old Faithful, but dependent upon someone who's not. You're very much in this situation, are you not? I know people like this. And what do they do? They weep like these, like these brethren did. Because they can't be with their brothers and sisters in Christ. What do we do about that? You can think of many other examples, I'm sure, of how we can become captive this way. This will suffice for what we're talking about this morning. You know that we can end up, though, in places of no fault of our own where we're going we're gonna to have to, we're going to be sad, we're going to weep, and we may not be able to, to be where and who, all right, I sh let me take that back, where we want to be. What did these brethren do? I, say, I keep saying brethren. Understand this. I, I know that they're not Christians, okay? I'm, I'm saying brethren and that they're faithful to God, okay? So if I say it again, you understand. These, these are Jews that were living before the new covenant, but they're God's children and they're faithful. What, what, did, what did they do? How could they cope with, cope with this? Well, like they said, we... They made up their minds to exalt God and remember God. And if they ever forgot it, they almost pronounced a curse upon themselves, didn't they? If I don't do it, do this. You find that a lot among the Jewish community. And so they dedicated themselves to remembering the God, uh, their God. They never lost trust in Him. They're in some dire circumstances of no fault of their own. And yet, what did they do? They still trusted God. That's the point I want to get across that no matter how bad the circumstances are or were, we've got to trust God. Now, that's really easy for me to say standing up here and not being in one of those situations in which we're talking about. Okay? But I, I do have friends and acquaintances that are in that situation. 
and what they're looking for, what they need. They need to hear from their brothers and sisters, you know, hang in there. Keep it up. Don't give up. Trust in the Lord. You're almost to the end. You're almost going to reach the goal, right? They need to hear that encouragement. The key is trust God no matter how bad it gets. And I believe that's exactly what, what these, uh, uh, these folks were doing. Not only that, understand this. In the end, we find out that they recognize that there's going to be a payday. That uh, those who are the reason for their captivity, God's going to take care of it. He's going to, to, to pay them back. Notice, if you will, verses 7 through 9. Remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it to its very foundation. Now, that in and of itself may not mean much to you unless you put it in context of, of what we've looked at on Sunday nights. And that is this, that when Babylon came in to destroy Jerusalem and wipe them out and carry them captive, Edom, who is said to be their brother, you remember, because of the tie to Esau, Edom was there encouraging them, chiding, chiding, uh, chiding the Jews in Jerusalem. And so you'll read in Jeremiah chapter 49 that Jeremiah, God through Jeremiah says, you're, you're, getting, you're going to be brought down. You're going to pay for it. The whole book of Obadiah is about bringing Edom down. You're going to pay for it. But these say, remember them. And not only that, verse 8, O daughter of Babylon, you uh, devastator, how blessed will be the one who repays you. Who's that going to be? That's going to be God with the recompense with which you have repaid us. How blessed will be the one, uh, quite a graphic picture here, who, dash, who seizes and dashes your little ones against the rock. Well, it sounds a little hateful and vengeful, but it's language that they were used to hearing and they had seen because it's exactly what the Babylonians had done. And so what they're saying is, God, you're going to be blessed. Don't forget to punish those people. And when you do, Edom and Babylon, you're going to pay to the extent that you made us to pay. God's going to bring it on you. Now, why would we bring this up? One, because we need to remember why we're in those circumstances, that we need to trust God. Number two, we need to remember that trusting God means that we're also going to leave the payback to God, right? We talked about it again. I just don't know how it happens every Sunday. We talked about it in class this morning, right? <laughs> and but it, it's the key to understanding it's the key to getting through these things i've got so much to worry about to, to just keep myself strong and faithful why in the world would i want to add to it a payback that won't give me any satisfaction and that only hurts my soul let's leave the vengeance up to the lord as in everything with god he will do it way better than we ever could right He'll take care of it. So all I need to do, leave the punishment stuff to God, trust Him to get through it. Put my eyes on Him to get through it. That's what, that's what we need to do. Now, these, these individuals here, were they ever delivered? Or did they stay there? Well, let me ask you. If they would have died in Babylon, would it have been okay? Could have been okay, couldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Because their deliverance didn't necessarily mean they had to go back to Jerusalem. They could have died there. No doubt some faithful Jews died in Babylon and, and uh, the end for them was, was a glorious ending. But they were delivered. Why? Because God said before they left, I'm going to bring you back. That God had a plan like he always does. And he brought them back. I want you to flip over real quick to Psalm 126. And this is where we're going to in the story psalm 126 so when you read psalm 137 it actually happened before what happens in 126 if i'm understanding things correctly and in psalm 126 we see a prayer given here when the lord brought back the captive ones of zion we were like those who dream our mouth was filled with laughter, our tongue with joyful shouting. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. 
Oh, the Lord has done great things for us. We're glad. And, and so, picture the language. And you can imagine, when, when we were able to come back, it was like a dream, right? We use that kind of phraseology today, don't we? Oh, it's a dream come true. As they thought about Zion and they wept for coming back to be in the presence of God, and God indeed delivers them today, could, you, you know, it, it would be surreal, wouldn't it? We're getting to go back. And so these captives were freed, and their mouth was filled with laughter, their tongue with joyful shouting. It's interesting to me what said next. They said among the nations, who do you think that is? But generally it refers to the Gentiles, anyone outside of the Jews here specifically, I, I, I think talking about Babylon. But nevertheless, the, the Gentiles were able to look at them and declare, the Lord has done great things for them, right? In that, in that uh, uh, Middle Eastern type of mindset and the way that people thought about gods, if you will, the more powerful the God, the, the more he would take his people where he wanted them to go. And so they recognized their God's stronger than our God's because, look, they're being delivered. And so the nations round about gave glory to God by saying he's done great things for them. And then something that I think is very important for you and I to remember in the latter part of the, in verse 3, notice the Lord has done great things for who? Us. We. We are glad. You ever prayed and, and, and desperately wanted to, to leave that situation where you found that your faith was being challenged over and over? Please, God, give me a way out. Please, please, I trust you. I'm going to stick with it. And then he delivers and right away we forget to say, thank you. You answered our prayer. You delivered us. And we do so with, with gladness, right? I've been guilty of that before. Come on, God, get me out of this. He gets me out of it. Time passes by and I think, big dummy, you forgot to say thank you, right? That should be the way we are when we get out of that situation. And let me ask you this as well. Could it be the case that maybe we won't get out of that situation in this life? Yeah, it could be. But let me ask you this as well. Shouldn't you continue to trust God? Shouldn't we, we continue to trust God? We should trust Him. I, I love reading the story about the three Hebrew youths in the, in the fiery furnace, right? Before Nebuchadnezzar. I, I love their words, and I hope it's words that that I would adopt if I were in a similar situation where they say to him, you know, um, our God's going to deliver us from this fire, but even if he doesn't, we're, we're, still not going, we're still not going to bow before you. Why? Because they knew that God would take care of them, right? They, they knew that he would. I hope that I have that kind of faith where I'm in a situation where it looks like, okay, it looks like the remainder of my days in, in this side of eternity are going to be like this. I'm going to trust God and know that when I breathe my last, that's when the deliverance will come. may not necessarily come right now. That's a hard one to hold on to, isn't it? It's hard for me. I'll tell you, it's hard for me. And yet, I believe that's exactly what Scripture teaches us, not only here, but elsewhere. Keep trusting God. And the time's going to come that you're going to be delivered. And then how are we going to want to be? How is it going to be? I think it's going to be like we read about in here, these first few verses. Oh, it's like a dream. <laughs> how can I not be shouting with great joy and rejoicing? A fantastic return. My time is running out on me, but you'll notice at the end of the psalm, I don't want to leave you hanging here. <laughs> he says, Restore our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. And so we might say, well, we thought they were back from captivity. Here's what I think 
Here's my, my, studied, my studied opinion, and it may be wrong. I wonder if this was written during the time, between the time that Zerubbabel came back and built the foundation of the temple, and then there was about a 16-year period, 20-year period, and then a couple of the prophets were sent and saying, Haggai, right, Zechariah, you need to get up and get busy and get back to work. And that it was during this time that, that uh, it was written, Restore our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Uh, this is something that we can relate to here in Phoenix. Um, uh, literally, the, the streams in the Negev, and that's the south land down uh, past the Dead Sea, if you look at the maps. But basically, you're looking at a bunch of wadis that are dry most of the year. And you know how it is here most of the year. It's dry. But man, when the rain comes, the flash floods, right, and fills it up. That's, that's the picture that he's saying here. And it, it's a picture of bring us back, bring us back this, this bountiful uh, type atmosphere. Those who sow in tears shall reap with joyful shouting. He who goes to and fro weeping, carrying his bag of seed, shall indeed come again with a shout of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. You know the song that we sing, right? The old one. Bringing in the sheaves. It's where it comes from. So you're taking out, and you may be out there sowing seed as you're weeping because you're going through life and you're in captivity and it just stinks. It's just hard. Here's what we want to get across this morning to you. No matter where you are in the process, weeping does not get the last word when you belong to the Almighty. We get to leave this life and know that weeping is not going to be our final destination. So I hope and pray it is this morning that if you face captivity in life like what we're talking about here, of no fault of your own, do what they did. Trust the Almighty. He's going to deliver you. Put your faith in Him. And in the end, all of us will be singing those songs of, of joy, those songs of rejoicing. And I think it will be just the way we read here. It was like a dream. How fantastic. If you are not a member of the body of Christ, we certainly want you to be. You may not know how to do that. We want to teach you. Uh, we want to show you God's Word and show you what God says about becoming one of His children. This morning we addressed uh, those who would cause some to be captive by being unfaithful and those who would be captive. I hope that if you fall in one of those categories and you need help or to be right with God that we can encourage you. I hope that you respond right now as Charlie leads us in a song. Won't you come while we stand and sing?